Anyway, let's get on to the, uh, the the topic here of data um, not being the new oil. Um, let, let's uh, let's let's hear um, kind of an amen for anybody who's kind of sick of uh, of hearing this um, this tired meme about data being the the new oil and kind of cut through the the clutter of what that what that really means or, or doesn't mean. So a number of years ago, um, the Economist proclaimed data as the new oil, and and hundreds of other consultants and let's call them thought followers uh, and others have jumped on and parroted this uh, this meme. Certainly, the proclamation. Uh, underscores data's increasing value in organizations, but um, from my perspective, entirely misses the point that data has unique economic characteristics, which make it potentially much more valuable than oil. So let's explore what uh, what some of those are. Here's some of the memes that we've seen, uh, e including data as the new plutonium, uh, one that's worth uh, further further research. I think uh, safe safely. Um, so uh, my, my name is not Inigo Montoya and you did not kill my father, but uh, by repeating this tired and inaccurate meme that data is the new oil, um, I feel that people are killing the broader and deeper opportunities of data to generate revenue streams from it. And uh, I will explain as we, we move forward here. First, you know, let, let's acknowledge the similarities between data and oil, which admittedly there are a few. Uh, it seems, however, that these characteristics are the ones that continue to really distract us uh, as data professionals and business leaders from realizing data's full full benefits. Yes, uh, of course, data can be acquired, but many companies are just not aware that unlike oil, data can be acquired or harvested not only from you know, their own business or the, the property that they own themselves, but also uh, harvested or licensed or traded from a wide variety of, of sources. You know, there are a trillion websites now from which data can be harvested. Um, there are billions of social media posts featuring trends and leading indicators that are potentially valuable. There are tens of millions of open data sets published by government organizations and others, thousands of data brokers and aggregators offering data for license, and an emerging crop of online data marketplaces. As well, uh, most businesses have dozens of business partners with whom they can exchange data with. So um, one of the, ch the challenges in, in many organizations is that they have a complete department dedicated to procuring, I don't know what I have here, for procuring office supplies, right? But they have zero people dedicated to procuring data supplies. I think in today's world, if you really wanna participate in the data economy, that's a tragic mistake. Okay. So next is, and of course, yes, data can usually, you know, be refined in a variety of ways to become much more usable and consumable by business processes. This, of course, involves integrating and cleansing and enriching data in, in ways for, for particular purposes. Um, and, and then, oh, and, whoop, and then we can, um, there we go. And, and data like oil or any other kind of asset, you know, is stored in some way, of course. And, uh, and then also it's piped to those who are using it or consuming it. And just like oil or other assets, data can be purchased. However, more often data is licensed which um, use in which usage rights, not ownership are, are conveyed to somebody. So this is an important point to, to remember. Also data like oil is used in fueling business processes, um, whatever those processes may be, and, and hopefully multiple processes. And, and increasingly data is not directed at eyeballs, but at those business processes themselves. So if your analytics organization is purely focused on building pretty pie charts and bouncy bar charts and dashing dashboards, well, they're probably stuck in the 1990s or 1980s and really should be focused on delivering data and insights and recommendations to business processes, not to, not to people. Um, data like oil can be processed and transformed into a variety of different kinds of products as well. And this is one of the great features of data is that it can be reused in multiple ways. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then another way that they're similar is yes, they can both be spilled. Um, and arguably, unlike oil, uh, when data is spilled, it cannot be cleaned up as readily as, as oil can. So something to keep in mind. And this is why companies spend a lot of money on, on data security. All right. So that's where the similarities end. Let's explore the key differences that make data much more valuable potentially than, than oil. All right. First, let's look at what happens when we use a drop of oil 
versus say a unit of data, say a transaction or a customer record. When you consume oil, you know what happens to it? It depletes, right? And you can't use that drop of oil ever again. Data or information, um, on the other hand, can be used over and over again without ever diminishing. Data is what economists would call a non-depleting asset. Yes, data's relevancy may diminish over time, but not if you continue to find innovative ways to use it. Uh, and if your business, uh, not only yourselves, but maybe others can use that data as well. So if, if your business model and processes are such that you only use data for a single purpose, then you're really not realizing its, its full potential. All right. Which gets us to the second major difference. When a drop of oil is being used, how many other ways can it be used simultaneously, right? None, that's right. So data, on the other hand, is an asset that can be used, oh, here we go, our sad uh, drop of oil here. Data, on the other hand, is an asset that can be used in multiple ways by multiple people or processes at the same time. It's what uh, economists would call a non-rivalrous asset. This is what makes data potentially exponentially more valuable than oil because we can use it multiple ways simultaneously. Okay, it's what it's called a non-rivalrous asset, All right? And then our third major difference between oil and data is what they produce when we use them. When we use data, say um, customer insights um, to generate more sales, these sales create more transactions that in turn create more data. It's a flywheel kind of scenario. This doesn't happen with oil. Using oil doesn't create more oil. You know, when we use a drop of oil, um, it simply creates heat, right? It creates energy and it creates pollutants. So data is what we would call a, uh, a, 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 a propagating or a regenerative asset. Again, making it that much more valuable than oil for organizations that appreciate and take advantage of this property. So these three main properties here of data being non-depleting, non-rivalrous, and propagating make data very different than oil. And these are the key characteristics that businesses that are thriving in the data age and the information age and in the data economy um, are taking advantage of. Think of any business that is really um, totally crushing it in the economy right now. They are reusing data, they're using it for multiple purposes, um, and they're using data to create more data, more opportunity. Basically, they're monetizing it in a variety of ways. So uh, these unique characteristics of data are at the core of, of infonomics, the, the concept that um, and, and discipline of treating data as an actual asset. Unfortunately, most companies don't even measure their data. Um, why? Because it's not yet a recognized balance sheet asset. The accounting practices are still stuck in the 1930s um, from, from that regard. And, and as the old adage goes, um, you can't manage what you don't measure, and it follows that you can't monetize that which you're not managing well. So for many companies, this becomes a vicious cycle of not measuring, therefore not managing, therefore not monetizing their data as well as they can. And it's a, it's a vicious cycle under leveraging available data assets, not only their own data assets, but data assets that are available externally as well. So the idea behind Infonomics is to reverse this curse. And um, that's really kind of the, the core the core concept there. So um, that's all I have for you today. A few simple, simple concepts on thinking about data as um, much more than the new oil. So I just want to thank you all for joining us here today and to the dedicated uh, folks, uh, Kate and others for inviting me. And as we move into the Q&A section, um, I am offering up a handful of Infonomics books to those reaching out to me with your ideas on the talk um, or your thoughts on uh, the concept of, of data versus oil. So you can reach out to me here on LinkedIn or, or email um, or Twitter. And uh, if you like what you hear today, I'm often tweeting and, and posting on LinkedIn on the, the topics of data monetization and data, data valuation and, and um, managing data as an actual asset. Um, I also teach an MBA course on infonomics through the University of Illinois, and that course is starting here in the uh, in the in the early summer in May. And uh, for those who aren't in the MBA program, you can take the courses also on on Coursera. Awesome! Oh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. thank you so very much for that presentation. We are ready for Q and A. First, I was just sitting here comparing comparing the number of buzzwords, and I think I think Scott wins in having less buzzwords in his book. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sure he does. I absolutely love your graphics and thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, the first question I want to get to is actually from George Birkin, who you're going to hear from on day three of the conference. Um, and his question is, if you were to compare data to something, what would that be? Wow. Um, I, I guess you might compare it more to something like a patent or a, uh, maybe a trademark, but probably a patent's a better, a better example. Um, a patent is something that uh, accountants have recognized as a balance sheet asset, but it has those same kind of characteristics of it being non-depleting and regenerative and multi-purpose. So um, you might you might think about that kind of intellectual property as an interesting analogy to to data companies that are using their patents for multiple purposes to generate multiple products, um, maybe even licensing those patents to others and using it again and again. Um, that might be a, an interesting analogy. Okay. Yeah. That's thanks for that. Good That's to see good. you. Um, question for Belka Sam. So is there a minimum data to save for a company? That's a great question. Um, and something that some of our clients are, are dealing with. I'm actually just working with a, a couple of clients to help them understand at what point economically should they be disposing of their data assets? Um, mm -hmm. We all like to kind of keep them around forever, but that also introduces a kind of risk, right? Uh, and, and an additional cost. So in Infonomics, um, I posited a number of, of models for quantifying data's value, and um, they can be um, combined in a couple of ways to identify data that's costing you more than the economic value that it's generating or the economic value that you have planned to generate from it. And in those cases, uh, you can make what's called a defensible deletion or defensible disposal uh, decision. And there's some great examples of companies that have, have done just that, saving millions of dollars a year in unnecessary infrastructure expenses. Now, I would caution you that make sure you, that you've thought about any and all ways that you can leverage that data first, not only yourselves, but externally. Think about your extended business ecosystem and all the ways that, that others could possibly leverage that data and, and generate economic value for, for your organization. Very interesting. Thank you for that. And we've got a question here from Frederick. Uh, I like the book. How do I get one? <laughs> <laughs> well, Frederick, if you already like the book, then you probably have it. But anyway, so uh, um, yeah, just reach out to me on LinkedIn or um, or, or email um, th on that slide. Um, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. And I have a handful of books that I'll make available. I can't give one to everybody, but um, we'll, we'll 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 draw. Kate will help me draw a few a few people to send a book uh, a signed copy to. Thanks. It's also Amazon. I got my book on Amazon, guys. You well, yeah, there's that way too. <laughs> sure. That's available on, on Amazon and elsewhere, right? Uh, it's available in audiobook and hard copy and um, hardcover and uh, an ebook. Oh, I didn't know you had an audiobook. Did you? Is it your voice in the audiobook? No, I just did the intro. Um, I realized how hard it is to actually narrate a book. Yes. <laughs> so we hired a professional to do it, but I, I did do the intro, and it took me like three hours just to do like two pages of intro. Oh, there. wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know that's that's hard work. Yeah. Um, question from Gabriel here: Could you give a glimpse on how to measure the value of data mm -hmm. information? Sure. Uh, the book um, goes into six methods, and I'll highlight them quickly. The first method is an aggregate of quality uh, characteristics like accuracy and completeness. It's called the intrinsic value model. The business value model also looks at key quality attributes, but also rolls in the concept of relevancy. How relevant is a given data asset um, against a range of business processes? The third mm -hmm. method is more empirical and looks at um, how data actually contributes to the improvement of some business KPI. Um, it's called the, the, the performance value of information model. And then what I've done is ad adapt the three main ways that valuation experts or accountants value any kind of asset, uh, like on the balance sheet, using the cost approach, the market approach, and the income approach. What does it cost you to create or generate that data? What is that data's market value on an open arm's length you know, market? Um, and remember that we can sell data over and over again, so we have to aggregate that, that value across all the potential uh, buyers or licensees. Um, and then uh, the third method is the is the uh, uh, income approach, what I call the economic value uh, of information, which takes into account how what what is a data asset's contribution to a revenue stream or expense savings, and then I subtract out the cost to acquire, uh, administer, and apply the data to kind of get a net value. So those six models are are uh, are detailed in the book along with examples and some you know assumptions that are baked into them. Good question. Great, thanks for that. We're gonna take um, a question here from Arihan. How do you see the data economy growing in the coming five years? Do you see some big changes in the way we consume data? 
Well, that's a that's a big question, probably for a, a, lo a longer topic. But um, it, in the next five years, I, I I see companies doing a couple of things. One is sharing data much more than than they are today. Um, finding ways to do that. There, there there are a lot of concerns about, for example, sharing customer data, and mm -hmm. uh, because of regulations like GDPR and and the California Consumer Privacy Act and HIPAA and and everything else. Um, but what companies aren't doing, and I and I, I talk about this, which is they're not thinking. Um, creatively about about it. While I can't sell you my customer data, I can sell your stuff to my customers. And so flipping that model, creating what I call an inverted data monetization uh, approach is something that we're working on with a number of clients, um, like a hospital who can't sell, I can't sell you, I know who my diabetes patients are, but I can't sell them to you. But I can't sell your healthy meal plan, your gym memberships, your at-home glucose monitoring kits. I can sell them to my diabetes patients and take a cut of that. So there are ways to monetize customer data without exposing it. And as more and more companies realize, the full breadth of ways to monetize their data, not just by selling it, um, I think that's gonna really help the, the overall data economy. Um, the other thing that we're starting to see is, is organizations become a, a um, um, uh, managing others' data. We see some of the large retailers now managing data for others, so creating mm -hmm. Um, extended information ecosystem is something that I think we'll start to see from a, a data management standpoint. Okay, great predictions. I need to borrow your crystal ball at some point to make other <laughs> predictions. <laughs> I've got a magic eight ball. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I know you touched on this already uh, about the, the data privacy, but the question from over here is it discussed in the book do you cover data privacy yeah i touch on data privacy a lot but there are there are other you know uh, much more savvy experts on that topic i it, it's a it's a big rat hole i didn't really want to get into too much but but yeah um some of the concerns uh, that i talk about in um in what I call the generally accepted information principles. Um, one of them deals with, with data privacy in particular, in that every time you every time you move data, every time you create a copy of data, whether you're moving it into a spreadsheet or a data or a data warehouse or a data lake, you're increasing your attack surface, you're increasing your costs, you're increasing your risks. So companies need to be economically circumspect every time you're moving data from one place to another or creating a copy of it. And so that that definitely has some privacy implications. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, and I think we're going to go with our very last question here because we're at time uh, from Bharat. How do you, how about a comparison of data versus electricity? What are your thoughts on that? Sure, that's a good comparison. Yeah, I had to think it all the way through, but that's that's certainly a good good comparison. Electrons are, are uh, uh, somewhat reusable, but um, I'm no physicist, so. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, and I'll just address Tony's uh, Tony's question. The name of the book is Infonomics, and you can find it on Amazon and other places. So, Doug, you're getting a lot of uh, questions that we simply can't take because we are at All time right. and have to keep this party going. But yeah, I'll take a look at them and, and uh, maybe post a, a little blog or something in LinkedIn. So, uh, search on LinkedIn for hashtag Infonomics, and um, and then I'll address some of the questions. Thanks, Kate. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Doug. I'll Cheers. see you. See you online.